Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're exploring the key messages and methods used by the 17th century poet Richard Lovelace in his poem The Scrutiny. So Lovelace was a 17th century cavalier poet who led an illustrious life as a soldier, a lover and a courtier. And this poem is really aimed at a male coterie of other soldiers seeking to play the field. It's playful with language and it focuses on lust over love and forces the intended listener into a passive position throughout the dramatic monologue. There is no voice of the woman. It's interesting to consider as well, at a time of civil war, this poem wasn't really just personal, but it was evidently political. It concentrates on ideas of sexual liberty and the pursuit of pleasure, which as a cavalier, Lovelace absolutely believed and was very anti-Puritan or at the time anti-Roundhouse. This poem concentrates on the scrutiny of his lover. This poem is set the morning after the night before where she clearly wants to extend their relationship beyond that night of passion, and our speaker does not agree. Let's look at the title to get a better picture of what is going on. So, scrutiny. It's generally seen as an intense critical observation or examination of something. And in our particular poem, the speaker is defending their choice not to be monogamous and not to stay with the lover that they've spent the night with. With the word scrutiny though, already in the title, it implies questioning someone else's view. Perhaps the lover that he's speaking to is disappointed by his argument. So this is a scrutiny of what has come before. We almost walk into a conversation midway and it's part of our analysis, actually, well, what has led up to so much for a defence from this lover? Why should you swear I am forsworn, since thine I vowed to be? Lady, it's already morn, and twas last night I swore to thee that fond impossibility. Have I not loved thee much and long? A tedious twelve hours space... I must all other beauties wrong and rob thee of a new embrace? Could I still dote upon thy face? Not but all joy in thou, thy brown hair by others may be found. But I must search the black and fair like skilful mineralists that sound for, un, for treasure in unploughed up ground. Then if when I have loved my round thou provest the pleasant she, with spoilers of meaner beauties crowned, I laden will return to thee, even satiated with variety. It's interesting to note throughout this poem, there's a series of rhetorical questions that are used. And actually, I think it heightens the arrogant tone of our speaker. Why should you swear I am forsworn since thine I vowed to be? He's like, listen, lady. I made that promise and yeah, last night I made a promise to be with you last night and now it's already morn. The frustration in that opening line of the word for sworn suggests that whoever he is speaking to is quite fed up. For sworn suggests you've had enough. But more than anything, um, I think we get quite clearly the sentiment of the cavalier actually in this, which is playing the field. It's quite a laissez-faire attitude anyway. It's a fond impossibility, right? He's not making any promises. He believes he's unable to be monogamous and that's something she's just got to deal with. It's also interesting to capture throughout this stanza that the time frame seems so immediate actually. It seems very lust driven. His timings are last night, it's morn. Whereas the contrast between that and the verb vowed, since thine I vowed to be. A vow is normally a promise that you're keeping for a lifetime. I associate the verb vowed with marriage. There's a huge juxtaposition between clearly what she wanted and what he's given her. Uh, as we look on to stanza two, it's interesting to see the plot thicken further. 
So in that opening two lines of the second stanza, have I not loved thee much and long? A tedious 12 hours space. I think two rounds of alliteration are found there to amplify the tedium that the, the speaker finds himself in. Uh, the alliteration there of loved and long uh, suggests uh, he feels like he's done his bit, he's had his fun, he's really bored of this conversation. And more than anything, the use of the word tedious um, is alliterative with 12 hours, but for him he's like, look, we've been there together for 12 hours, that's enough for me, thanks. I also think if we skip on to his uh, mid-section, the capitalization of the word beauties reinforces his objectification of women and also his priorities. And they are other women. I think we've also got to accept that he doesn't just see this encounter with this current woman as an important moment for them both. He's now thinking of his immediate future. I must all other beauties wrong. The, the phrasing there, the imperative call of I must, he's obliged to, he must seek out other women. And interestingly enough, he is powerless, it would seem, but to be there for these other beauties, if he were to let them down, that would just be wrong. You know, he's got this call to, to seek out other lovers. Lucky him. I also think the aggressive verb there and rob you, rob thee of a new embrace. He's like, listen, you know, I don't want to hold you back. And the idea that he could possibly thieve um, somebody else from being pleasured by this woman is an interesting argument to get his way. But then there's an, also a kind of implied uh, resentment as well. Could I still doze upon my face? Like, I couldn't do it as well as somebody else could. So two rounds of argument there to get what he wants, which is for her to go away and him to move on. By stanza three, we're using another round of devices to reinforce the idea that this love was really just one night. So this stanza concentrates quite a lot on what's next for him. He's like, I like your brown hair, but I must search for black and fair. So it's interesting that um, we're now looking at the superficial qualities of woman. He's clearly in pursuit of lust. It feels like the attraction there is based on physical, not anything deeper. And more importantly, you know, the acknowledgement that she has brown hair, so he at least, you know, knows what she looks like. It wasn't just in the in the night time. We've got some interesting contrasts running through, though. He's like, yeah, you've got nice brown hair, um, but I have to search. I have to, that imperative call again, search for those with different, you know, like the black-haired ladies and the fair-haired ladies. The fact he's already considering the, their other hair is quite interesting. Um, I actually think this stanza is pretty creepy. There's an eerie sibilance, actually, um, as we move further. Where it's, uh, but I must search the black and fair, like skillful mineralists that sound uh, for treasure in unplowed up ground. The skillful mineralists that sound and that search there. It's almost meant to seem like he's being commissioned to go forth and find these other people. But actually, um, it affects the supposed compliment he's paying her, that he found her with brown hair and he must go forth and find others that are beautiful. It actually just sounds a bit creepy. I also think it's a strange one that the implications of virginity being a priority as something to claim are what we see through the simile, like skillful mineralists that sound for treasure in unplowed up ground. So treasure there is the virginity, but the simile of him being a skillful mineralist, that he's going to go and dig this stuff up in the unplowed ground. Treasure definitely implies women are these kind of objects that are to be found and used, and it also associates that their wealth is in their virginity, and that love is, is something you'd associate with wealth, but in their purity. The issue of unplowed up ground, it definitely links to this sense that he's an adventurous, almost aggressive, um, laissez-faire attitude to lust. He's, he's off to new pastures new. He's not really prepared to stick around. He's only really plowed up that ground with her. Again, I think that imperative call within this stanza reminds us he really feels commissioned to go forth and change the face of uh, many other women's worlds by being some Lothario elsewhere. So by this stanza, our Lothario is now thinking, how can I navigate this with this woman? So his argument thickens with some really interesting twists and turns. 
He's like, look, I will go around and I will see other women. And if that leads me back to you, well, lucky you. I'll be a better lover because of the, the variety I've encountered. So straight away, we've got this idea with spoils of Mina Beauty's crown. Spoils to me links to the ideas of doing battle. So women to him are merely conquests. And if there are worse beauties and I come back to you, well, lucky you. It's quite a hollow hope, I think, for a future together. If thou provest the pleasant she, and the alliteration there of provest the pleasant, it's quite a calming idea that they could be together. He's hanging on that hope as if the listener is really enchanted and exceptionally enamoured by it. The idea of satiated with variety always makes me feel a little bit sick. It implies the strength and the benefits from his sexual adventures elsewhere. But it's quite an arrogant idea, I think, like so many other metaphysical poets that we've already encountered together. He's assuming she'd still be waiting for him. Her voice is gone from this poem, and I think that's part of its its interest for us. Is well, these gentlemen expect these women to just be ready. Awful. Let's now consider what the structure has to teach us. So you can see throughout that this poem follows an A B A B A rhyme scheme. But additionally, it uses questions to form the basis of his somewhat hollow argument as to why he must move on. The logic behind his argument feels calculated, and I think this is reinforced by the regular rhyme scheme that I've already mentioned to you. Additionally, the repetition of the first person throughout this poem really amplifies his selfishness and how little he actually cares really about what she thinks or as does the um, the absence of of the lover's voice more than anything throughout this poem we get the immediacy of desire that this speaker has their past present and future needs are considered throughout what the speaker is telling us so we've got you know in stanzas one and two it's a fixation on the past the immediate past at that of last night and the morning in stanza three, we've got his present ambitions to go forth and search for these other women in unplowed up grounds with his somewhat dodgy simile. And by stanza four, we've got his future suggestions of how he may come back if she is crowned the most wonderful woman that he's ever slept with. More than anything, we back away from this poem and can have to evaluate it in terms of his short term vision of greed and, shelf and selfishness. And also it is a masterful work in terms of its comedy value. We can really hear the, the scoffs of the readers at the time really enjoying Lovelace's play on lust and love. 